Okay, hello everyone. This is Colin Cox, and this is the week five audio lecture for English 1010. Today, I primarily want to discuss one of the two reading assignments I asked you to complete, the Laurie and Manus essay, It's a Living. Now, I may say a quick something, depending on time, about the Hopkins essay, which is an analysis of or an exploration of the television sitcom Friends, but if you would have the Manus essay in front of you, and I want to talk about it primarily as a definition essay, but I also want to talk about it as an example of how you can incorporate narrative into an essay that attempts to use a totally different pattern. Um, regarding Lori and Manus, she actually was a student at Northeast State Community College, so uh, this is an example of a student essay. She, as I understand it, produced this essay in a class that's not so dissimilar from the one you are taking. So with this essay, I think it's clear from the introduction that she wants to define what work is for her. And again, what's really fascinating about this essay is how work operates as both an idea or a concept, but for Manus, it's very much grounded in this real concrete material place. So this is another example of how these different ways of thinking about a definition essay intersect with one another. It's not just a place for Lorianne Manis. It is certainly that, but work is also an idea. It's a perspective. You could even argue it's a philosophical orientation, and I'll talk about all of that when I talk about what I ultimately think her point or her thesis is. But let's start with just the introduction Introduction to the essay because I think this introduction does several interesting things. It establishes several important tenets or characteristics of this essay. So this is what Manus writes. I work in the fluting department at an endodontics manufacturing plant. Every weekday and occasionally on Saturday, 2.55 p.m., find me passing through the glass doors of this painfully nondescript building, remarkable only for its clumsy, sprawling architecture. A large red sign warns me that alcohol, drugs, and firearms are prohibited, adding redundantly that these items are not allowed on the property. The vehemence of this message seems to imply that those of us passing through the doorway have an unusually strong tendency or desire to drink alcohol, abuse drugs, and avail ourselves of the quickest, most simple means to homicide or suicide. An acrid, unidentified odor lingers in the entry, hurrying my progress through the second set of glass doors. Perhaps it is the scent of despair. So the first thing you'll notice, and I talked about this with the first essay, which was primarily a narrative essay, Menace begins by thrusting her reader in a situation. So this introduction effectively establishes that Manus wants to uh, use narrative as a pattern. And again, I think this is important because what I don't want anyone to think is the work we do in previous um, essay units, I don't want you to think that you cannot use those same characteristics in future essays because I absolutely think you can. I think narrative... Um, for example, is a fantastic pattern when thinking about forms of development, ways of developing an essay, and you can certainly see Manus doing that here. What I also like, and I think this beautifully complements the way she uses narrative throughout this essay, there's a lot of description here, a lot of showing and not telling. Consider, for example, the language that appears outside of this factory. It's a sign that says, alcohol, drugs, and firearms are prohibited. And pause for a second and think about what that suggests, but also think about how Manus orients herself to this. I think this is one of the first times that Manus introduces this clear conflict between herself as a worker and, let us say, for a lack of a better phrase, management, right? This is an idea that she develops throughout the essay, the lack of care that management seems to have, because I think for someone like Manus, and I think any one of us would potentially read it the same way, 
there's something insulting about this, right? What's the implication here? Is the implication that anyone walking through these doors would bring alcohol, drugs, and firearms to the premises? And sure, maybe that happened in the past, but Again, I want you to imagine just for example, if on the syllabus, one of the first things I said was, um, not that we meet um, on campus, but imagine if it said, hey, don't bring drugs and alcohol and guns to class, right? I, I think you would almost read that as a kind of insult. There's something um, potentially patronizing about it. And that's certainly how Manus reads it. But again, I think as it helps to develop her larger point, it's this suggestion that this place is deeply, deeply frustrating and deeply dehumanizing. And you'll also notice, again, the way she's not just interested in what she sees, but also what she smells. And you can almost imagine that it's a, it's a kind of smell that you can practically taste, right? Quote, an acrid, unidentified odor lingers in the entry. It's, it's such a powerful way of starting. She establishes a particular tone about this place, and I think the language she uses is really interesting and sophisticated. Manus, she has clear control of how she uses language. Everything feels extremely deliberate, and I don't know, there's something a bit bombastic about her language, which is to say there's a kind of, of dramatic um, flourish here. And we see these kinds of dramatic flourishes throughout the essay. And I think in the wrong hands, that probably wouldn't work. But I, I think the reason why it works with Manus is because she's quite consistent about it throughout. So that level of care, that's something that students only achieve through, again, deliberate and careful editing. Um, but as we continue, you'll see that this feeling of degradation, this sense of insult, carries throughout the essay in some precise and pointed ways. So here I want to pick up with the uh, second paragraph, and this is what Manus writes. To my right stands the door to the crowded, noisy break room. To my left, a carpeted path leads to the unknown regions of the front office. I open yet another set of doors and find my time card among the many in the metal holder. Like a credit card, it is swiped in the new electronic time clock, proving that I'm there on time, but not too early. So again, a couple of interesting things here. Notice the level of detail. We are very much in this workspace, which helps to define what for Manus is so troubling about this space. And one of the things that I really like here is the way she introduces this clear contrast between the work environment that she occupies and this nebulous, almost alien work environment that the, the office workers occupy. And this is something, if you continue reading, you might recall um, the way she describes the floors um, where, where she works, right? It's extremely dangerous. I believe at one point she describes the, uh, the mats as, as like burning and deteriorating. So her work environment, it's defined by precarity. It's dangerous, it's precarious, but this very subtle reference to carpet I think is extremely important because think about carpet as not just a fabric, but as a symbol or as a metaphor, right? I don't know, my, my mother, I remember, was quite fussy about the carpets in, in our home when I was a child, and one of the things she always said was, it's just so hard to get out dirt or to get out mud or a stain on carpet, which suggests that carpet is extremely delicate. It's something that one handles with a kind of care. And so think about what that suggests or the contrast that suggests. The people who occupy that space, maybe it suggests they're more delicate or maybe more importantly, the kind of work they do isn't nearly as dangerous as the work that Manus and her compatriots perform. And again, I think even if you imagine the sorts of shoes that people might wear, they're not wearing um, dirty, muddy or or like chemical stained boots they're probably wearing um heels they're probably wearing dress shoes again thinking about that space this this again this 
unknown region of this factory as a space that fundamentally doesn't belong to her. She would be out of place there. And again, I think this only, I mentioned this before, I think this only helps to develop this idea that for Lorianne Manis, she perceives and interprets a clear class divide here. There is space for her and her compatriots, the people who do the kind of work she does, then there's the space for management, perhaps. And that those those spaces, that is to say, those spaces, they they never really intersect or co-mingle. They're segregated off from one another. And I think for Manus, this is part of what makes this job so dehumanizing. This is part of the drudgery. This is part of the frustration. Um, and if we continue throughout the essay, oh, there's there's one other thing I meant to mention. I think this is so important as well. Again, thinking about this idea, what is what is so um, dehumanizing about this job and about this space? Notice this reference to um, clocking in, right? And you can see that within this environment, um, someone like Lorianne Manis, one of the workers, they're not encouraged to. Uh, clock in early, right? I'll read it one more time, proving that I'm there on time, but not too early. Now let's pause for a second and think about the implications here. I think there's a clear financial implication, right? People who clock in early, they in theory make more money than people who do not. But I think the point Manus wants to make is slightly different because I think the point she wants to make relates to enthusiasm. So why, under what circumstances do you arrive early? Whether it's for a job or maybe for a social event, it's when you're excited, right? Um, if you're anything like me and you have a social event you're excited about, it's really hard to just wait around until it's time to leave, an appropriate time to leave, right? You often find you arrive early. And I think here, part of the reason why someone like Lorianne Manis is discouraged from a right, excuse me, part of the reason why someone like Lorianne Manis is discouraged from arriving early is because this is a place that wants to actively discourage enthusiasm. I think that's possibly one way of reading this, that again, for someone like Lorianne Manis, because she adds that detail for a reason, there's a purpose here, she wants us to understand that even if one were theoretically so inclined to enjoy this work, the mechanisms or, or the mechanics of this job, it will prevent you from feeling enthusiasm about this space. And again, I think that's so important. Even the idea of someone being enthusiastic about this job, that is something that this job fundamentally discourages. And she continues throughout the essay providing interesting and thought-provoking details, but one of the more ambitious moments of the essay, I would argue, is when we have all of these references to maybe things people say, noises she hears. It's near the end of the essay, and you'll notice that Manus doesn't provide signal phrases, so there's no language before or after any of these quotes that maybe identifies the name of a person. Um, I think context clues are quite revealing and suggestive. I think, for example, um, it's pretty clear when maybe a member of management speaks over the uh, PA system. I think it's pretty clear that at one point she's attempting to simulate for us the sound of a song. But notice how because there isn't a a clear trajectory to any of this. Like, there's no causal chain here. There's no reason why don't run no more on 29. I have to get Craig to look at it. There's no reason why that would be first. I think all of this helps to create a feeling and an impression, right? Again, another moment where Manus wants to show instead of tell. It's just a indecipherable cacophony of sound. And there's some interesting details here that I think we can certainly talk about. One of them is um, when she says, as something of a preamble to all of this, surely the words change every day, though it seems to me that they don't. And I think that is, is potentially a reference to, for example, this person who uh, um, wants to talk about maybe their granddaughter, right? Quote, do you know what that little devil of a Katie said to me today? She said, Grandma. The idea that 
people are just having the same conversations over and over. And, you know, if you've worked um, in a space or an environment with other people where you need to fill time by talking, I think you might find, and, and I think we all do this, right? I certainly do this. We just seem to talk about the same things over and over again. There is a kind of repetitive monotony to this, and I think it's something that Manus accurately identifies as something that's that's just really frustrating about this work environment. But also, um, the idea that management, for example, wants to wish uh, Teresa Jones a happy birthday, but they do so belatedly, right? Again, even management, they can't get their dates right, which, again, I think further develops one of these smaller but significant points she wants to make about management's relationship to and the way it thinks about people like Lorianne Manis, the people who work on the floor, for lack of a better phrase. Um, but I think Manis's point really becomes clear with the final paragraph. And I said something similar with the George Orwell essay, A Hanging. What would happen if we ended the essay at a particular moment? Well, Orwell's point would be fundamentally different. And I think without this conclusion, Manus's point would be fundamentally different. So let's read this conclusion together, and then I'll offer you some thoughts and some commentary. So here's what Manus writes in the conclusion. So, is the sum and total of this place only gloom and danger, monotony and indignity, drudgery and filth? No, there is redemption, and it is this. At 11 p.m., we leave. The laborers crowd through the front doors and toss cheery goodbyes and inside jokes back and forth, and there's laughter, always laughter. Although we know we'll be returning soon, still, we have this helium exultation, this laughter that is prayer and hosanna, for had our spirits not suffered a little death, could we know, in the special way that people like us do know, the rapture of real, warm-blooded life. And so I think what this conclusion does, how it maybe changes the way we should think about Manus's point is, and she even says it with the topic sentence to her conclusion. So is the is the sum total of this just drudgery, monotony, indignity, etc.? And the answer is no. The answer instead is this job, work for Lorianne Manus. And I think here we see the culmination of the definition pattern. Work is perspective for her. And if you are someone who has worked a shift job, maybe at a restaurant or at a factory, you might have a sense of what she means. And, and I'm always delighted when I talk to my students on campus about this in a more traditional non excuse me, in a more traditional um, non online course, because I always ask them, you know, what's the best moment of your shift? it's that second when you walk out the door, right? Like that is, it is extremely hard to replicate that feeling. And I think for Manus, her point is the only way to actually get that feeling. You can't just manufacture that. You cannot buy that. You cannot barter or trade for that. You need to earn that. You, you only through a contrast do you really understand that feeling. And I think that is quite interesting because with this conclusion, Manus, she even challenges herself a little bit. Again, imagine what this essay would look like without that paragraph. I think we would probably come to the conclusion that Manus, in a way that is, is completely understandable and, and something that we could sympathize with her about, Work, this job, as she said, it's just drudgery and indignity and insults, etc. But Manus does more with it. Again, I love how she introduces this premise, but then she seems to challenge it and undercut it to some degree at the end. And that's a really clever thing to do because I think in a lot of ways, she even challenges us. I, I wonder what any of you felt or thought of this essay as you arrived at the conclusion, because I think there is an 11th hour turn or conversion here, which is interesting. And that might also help to explain, because you may have noticed this, right? All of the overt religious language and imagery at the end. I think for someone like Manus, she almost wants to suggest the end of one of these long shifts 
it has a kind of religious fervor to it. Maybe that's the best comparison she has is this is, um, for me, what religion feels like. Religion is ending your shift and then feeling that revelation, that that revelatory sensation as as you or as I or as she um, walks away from um, from this factory toward their cars. But also notice, and I think this is so important as well, this is a communal experience. This is not just a single isolated experience. Pay attention to her language, right? It's a lot of we's here. It's not a lot of I's. Um, she has transitioned from someone who's focused singularly on her experience at this factory to someone who instead wants to focus on this collective moment of joy. And yes, it's not perfect, right? We will return at some point, but we have this. And so those are my overall thoughts about this essay. There's certainly more. I always say this. I'm sure there is more we could say. But one of the things that I think Manus, and I'll just quickly summarize here, I, I think she effectively uses narrative as a pattern and pairs it with a definition pattern. I also think she fundamentally changes the potential point of this essay with this conclusion. Again, I wonder what you thought her point was before reading the conclusion, because I think she not only challenges herself, but I think she challenges us as well. And I think you could also imagine there's this way that she moves or, or transitions from this isolated individual experience to a big group collective experience. And, and with that collective experience, there is joy, there is celebration, so on and so forth. So, okay, I'll take a couple of minutes and just say a quick something about the Hopkins piece. So one of the reasons why I asked students to read this essay is because I think, again, it's an interesting example of how a definition essay could work because it's a essay that wants to uh, perhaps offer a definition of not just the TV show Friends, but maybe specifically how Friends um, operates or functions in contemporary society. But I also think the premise is just extremely clever and interesting because it is an essay that takes popular media and popular entertainment seriously. And this is something, it's something that I talk about a lot in my literature courses, that we we should take popular entertainment seriously, that we we should not just dismiss it as something trivial, but but we should think about how it affects us as a culture. We should think about how it creates um, distinct possibilities for how we can and should understand ourselves in the world. And this is not one of those like rap music causes kids to do bad things screeds. I, I don't believe that. I certainly don't think that's true. And the same thing with video games. My God, there's, there's absolutely no um, credible or reputable research that suggests that's true. Um, but instead, it's, it's this idea that popular entertainment offers possibilities or or it offers all of us ways of thinking about again how we want to be in the world what our identities could be especially with television shows where the the creators of these shows often um create characters who are archetypal in a lot of ways. Um, think about it, a show like Friends, right? All of these characters fit neatly into certain oversimplified categories. And I think that, again, allows us to think about how we want to be in the world and who we want to be. But I think more importantly with an essay like this, what I like so much about it is how it fundamentally challenges what I think the text of Friends says and argues. And I also, one of the reasons why I selected this essay is because many of my students are familiar with Friends, right? Whether you are an avid watcher or not, um, I found very few students who don't know what the TV show Friends is. But if you are an avid watcher or a casual watcher, I think one of the things you might know is um, Ross is, at least from a credential perspective. He's the most accomplished person in this friend group. And 
despite those accomplishments, he's often the source of insult and derision, right? And listen, it's not like Ross is, you know, some, uh, he's, he's not some doctor of some esoteric form of history or whatever. He's a paleontologist, right? And so friends began, I believe, in the early 90s. This was around the time that Jurassic Park was in movie theaters. Like, Dinosaurs were super cool, and they are super cool, but as his friends see it and understand it, dinosaurs are not cool. Dinosaurs are not interesting, and maybe it's because of, of the person who delivers or attempts to deliver all of this information, and I think Hopkins's point is, and really his thesis, which I think is a lot clearer than maybe some of the other essays I've asked you to read, it's, it's a thesis that ostensibly argues that we should be skeptical of how Ross's friends interact and engage with him. And this is what Hopkins writes. To me, friends signals a harsh embrace of anti-intellectualism in America, where a gifted and intelligent man is persecuted by his idiot compatriots. And even if you see it from my point of view, it do, and even if you see it from my point of view, it doesn't matter. The constant barrage of laughter from the live studio audience will remind us that our own reactions are unnecessary, redundant. So I think what I what I like about this thesis is how, yeah, it takes popular entertainment seriously, but it it also wants to again antagonize how the show wants us to think about Ross. In many ways, it's a kind of minority report, right? Because there's the way the friends within this group react to him, and I think referencing the audience or the laugh track I think is important, because if you've watched um, multi-cam laugh track sitcoms, you know that the laughter can really trigger a reaction from you at times. You know, there's this wonderful philosopher who once said, the laugh track is there to laugh for us. Um, and I, I think that also has the effect of blinding us to, uh, as, as Hopkins says, what's really troubling about this group, how Ross is this smart, seemingly impassioned person, but it's this group and their disinterest that really seems to uh, grind him down. And listen, let's be clear about something. Hopkins is being a little funny here with his language. Maybe he's being a bit bombastic, maybe even a bit ironic, even though I, I actually think he he believes this thesis. This is not one of those situations where we should come to the conclusion that he thinks the opposite because he's just deploying so much irony. But when he says where a gifted and intelligent man is persecuted by his idiot compatriots, I think there is something perhaps deliberately funny about that language. It, it does seem to elevate the stakes in a way that seems inconsistent with, again, a 20-minute sitcom on a network TV show. Um, but, but I think it can be both, which is, which is part of the point. It can be maybe a funny and irreverent thesis, but it still, I think for someone like Hopkins, has a kernel of truth to it. That that maybe part of the reason why, if you are, again, someone who likes friends, maybe one of the reasons why you receive Ross the way you do is because that's how the friends receive him. That's how the, the laugh track and the studio audience almost encourages you to receive him as a character. And so in that way, I like how Hopkins tries to cut against the grain of all of that influence. Um, but much like the Laurie Ann Manis essay, I think it's an excellent example of how a definition pattern can work. And again, I mentioned this before, but I think it bears repeating because I think this is so important. It takes popular entertainment seriously, which is always something that I encourage my students to do. So, okay, I think that's where I'll stop just because of time constraints, but I hope you found this lecture interesting and, and useful. But if you have any questions, as always, do not hesitate to contact me. Thank you again. And again, this is Colin Cox for English 1010.